English. Well, if you're glad to be here, give me a good amen. Amen. Thank you so much for being here tonight. And uh, well, I hope the farm, fire marshal don't walk in. Amen. This place is full. And I didn't realize how many folks were here until I turned around. Thank you. Thank you. How many of you, you drove more than an hour to be in the service tonight? You drove more than an hour? Oh, wow. That's a whole lot of you. How many of you go to Clearbrook and you'll admit it? Oh, praise God. Amen. And uh, we've got the choir behind us tonight. That is always, it makes me feel like I have a kick me sign on my back while I'm preaching. So uh, I promise I'll turn around and I'll share some word with you guys. But uh, thank you so very much for being here and thank you pastor for letting me come it's an honor to be here let me tell you something about a pastor from a pastor that you need to understand about pastors and that is this it is a big deal when a man of God will open up the building and his pulpit and the platform and give the microphone to a guy that most people only know in three to five minute video sound clips on Facebook although we've known each other and we have a lot of the same connections and contacts but let me tell you something every guy that calls himself a preacher with a Bible under his arm and a bad toupee these days is not called to the Holy Spirit, you understand. And so when a man allows me to come into his church and share his pulpit and open the Word of God to his people, to me that is a big deal because I take seriously the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ and I know he does and it's a great honor for me to be here and to be able to preach in your pulpit. I want you to go to Acts chapter 7 if you would tonight please. Acts chapter number 7 uh, in the Word of the Lord. And I know so many of you have come a long ways. Good to see a few friends that I've known from the years uh, when I was in evangelism. Uh, we have some folks, I'm not going to embarrass them tonight, but we have a lady in particular I met a moment ago that uh, drove, listen, not 200 miles to get to the service. She drove 200 miles to pick up her mom and 400 more miles to get to the service and was here three hours early before the thing ever started. And, uh, and they're here tonight for one service from the Pocono Mountains. That's a long way from here, neighbor. And uh, so I appreciate them being here. It's amazing what the Lord can use as a platform these days, isn't it? And uh, man, I just look at that little iPhone sitting over there and I think to myself, how in the world will I ever known that that little iPhone was going to be used as a pulpit to reach the nations with the gospel of Jesus Christ? And uh, what a humbling honor that is. And I tell you, every time I go somewhere and uh, visitors and people just start showing up, it, it is truly amazing to me. And I say to God be the glory, great things he has done. And so I'm honored to be in your midst tonight. Well, Acts chapter 7, a very familiar passage maybe to some, but super unfamiliar to many of you perhaps. And I was reading through this some time ago in my personal study and something just jumped off the page that I want to share with you tonight. And so we're going to pray and we're going to jump right in. We got a lot of word work to do tonight in the text. And so let's pray and get started. Father, thank you so very much for all of these folks that are here tonight. I thank you again for this pastor, for this church hosting this meeting, open up their doors to the community and people all over this state. Father, I pray tonight that you would empty me of Greg Locke and you would fill me to overflow with the wisdom, the passion, and the discernment of the Holy Spirit. Every one of us in this room are here tonight because we are needy, and we need the authority and the influence of the Word of God to do what a mere man cannot. Lord, if folks are here tonight just to hear from me, they're going to be sorely disappointed. We need something from heaven. Lord, we thank you for the music. We thank you for the fellowship. We thank you for the excitement, for the anticipation, for the prayer meeting before the service, for everything that's gone into it. But Lord, at the end of the day, all is vain unless the Holy Spirit moves in our midst tonight. And so we pray that you would do a mighty work. And as we stand on the authority of God's word, we know that by faith, you are going to radically change our lives. Don't let us walk in and walk out the same individuals. Change us tonight because of the power of the word of God in Jesus name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. In Acts chapter number seven, let me quickly build the historical narrative of what's about to take place. The very first individual in the entirety of history that we know about that ever died for their faith as a martyr was a man by the name of Stephen. And Stephen was being stoned by the government, more in particular and specifically, he was being stoned by the religious church going crowd because of his stand on the gospel. He was standing up and standing out, speaking up and speaking out, and the people said, oh no, what? What you are preaching is heretical, and they literally stoned this man to death. But before they rocked his world, they gave him a last opportunity to preach a message. And they said, you know what? We're going to give you a chance as a dying man. We're going to kill you, but we're going to
to give you a chance to say anything that you would like to say. And they gave him the microphone, and that turned out to be an absolute blessing for us, but a blistering for them. Because one message immediately became two. His first one and his last one. And I've been in a lot of churches where that's happened with me. But nonetheless, he preaches the Bible so demonstratively that literally they kill him. But before they get a chance, he preaches a message literally from Genesis all the way through the end. I mean, he starts way back in the beginning and he begins to exalt the sovereignty of God. He talks about Abraham, Isaac, and David. I mean, he throws it out there. But he says some things about Moses that I'd never seen before. And I was reading and just kind of chronolo chronologically going through the Bible and I got into Acts and I was studying it for a, a sermon that I'm going to be preaching to our folks pretty soon in a series in the book of Acts. And I saw some things that he began to say about Moses. You ever read something in the Bible and thought, wow, I've never seen that before. It just began to pop off the page. And so I poured an extra pot, not a cup, but extra pot of coffee. And I sat there and I said, wow, there's some intriguing stuff in here that I've got to sink my teeth into. And I'm telling you, it blessed my heart. And I pray tonight it'll do the same for you. I want to pick up in verse number 20 of the story. So he's telling this story, recounting what happened in the Old Testament, book of Exodus. But notice as it begins to play out, Acts 7 and verse number 20. He says, In which time Moses was born, and was exceeding fair, and nourished up in his father's house three months. And when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for her own son. Now I take for granted that many of you know the story of Moses, and yet here in this context, when things were real bad, uh, when the government was as wicked and deviant and vile and filled with debauchery as it could be, I love that first little phrase in verse 20. It says, In which time? Meaning by that, at the very divine design of God, when nothing seems like it was going to be right, when everything politically was falling apart, God sent the man for the minute. And let me call a time out and say this. I don't care how wicked it gets, God will still have a remnant of righteous people that are willing to stand up and speak the truth of the gospel, in which time means that God's in control even when the bottom falls out, you understand. So don't get super nervous about what's happening around the world because oops and uh-oh are not in God's vocabulary. I read the back of the book and it doesn't end with oh me, it ends with amen. I know how the whole thing turns out, you understand. They can say what they want to, but God's going to get the last laugh. So in that day, Moses was born. And watch what he was. He was an exceeding fair individual. So ladies, this cat was a looker. I mean, this guy looked good. He had some bulging biceps. He grew into the Don Juan Suave of the Old Testament. He could walk off the front cover of GQ magazine. He was a massively awesome individual. He was a fair, exceedingly fair man and nourished up in his father's house three months. Now, here's the story that's interesting. You remember in the Old Testament, Pharaoh was a little bit jealous, and so he started killing babies left and right. And so he said, you're going to take those baby boys, and you're going to kill them. Well, his parents decided, we love God, and we love our family far too much to do this. And so they hid Moses, rather than obey the edict of the Pharaoh, of the king, and for three months, they hid him in the house. Now, I find it interesting that it uses that time frame, three months, because that's a about as long as you could probably keep a newborn baby quiet without folks finding out about it. How many of you know, especially if you've grown up in church, you can walk into the biggest room in the entirety of America and one dirty diaper will soil the entirety of that place and you can smell that stuff for a mile away, right? I got four kids, I'm telling the truth. And so they knew that the diapers were going to start stinking. They knew that they could not keep that baby quiet any longer than three months because when the soldiers came by looking for babies, they knew something's going to have to give. They're going to find our son and they're going to butcher him. And so in one last ditch effort, remember what his mama did? She makes a basket. She goes down to the river, she puts him in a basket, and she basically prays this prayer of finality. Lord, you're going to have to do what I can. She kicks the basket out into the water, and the Bible says that when he was cast out, he was taken up by Pharaoh's daughter. I find that interesting. The very guy that wanted to kill him was now going to have him living in his house, and the government was going to pay the bills. Isn't that a blessing, right? And so he floats out there, and she's out there bathing herself one day, and she sees this basket, and she goes and opens it up, and what do her wondering eyes behold? but there's a bouncing baby boy and guess what it's a Hebrew boy so not only is it a baby it's one of the babies that should have already been massacred in this major butchering and she sees it and God gives her an affinity in her heart for this young man 
And if you know anything about the story, it is one of the greatest testimonies to the sovereignty of God in the entirety of the history of the world. Here's what happens. She goes and a young lady comes to her and says, would you like me to go back to the land of Goshen and find one of the Hebrew ladies that can raise this Hebrew child because as an Egyptian, you may make a decent mother, but you'll never be able to nurture this Israeli child the way that a Hebrew lady can. And the Bible says that the young lady went back and called for the boy's mother. And his own mother got to come back into Pharaoh's house and raise the very baby that she had just given up. I'm telling you, that's a testimony to the divine design of what God's doing in people's lives. And so she raises him, and watch what the Bible says in verse 22. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. And he was mighty in words and in deeds. Now, I want you to pay very close attention to the words that are here in this context. We do call this the Word of God. It's not called the thoughts of God, the stories of God, the ideas of God. It's called the Word of God because Peter said every word of God is for our learning and admonition. So we have to pay attention to the details theologically that are here. And so this man, he is raised, he is matured around the greatest libraries. He had the fastest internet access of their day, if you will. This guy graduated graduated top of the class, magna cum laude, sum cum laude, whatever that means, I graduated magna cum lucky. But nonetheless, this guy graduated with honors. He had a PhD par excellence. He could communicate himself out of any situation. The Bible said he was mighty in word and in deed. So Moses had the greatest education that the world at that time had to offer. The guy could speak well. He was a good looking guy. He could walk into a room and light up any situation take care of any circumstance, any communication problems. He didn't have any. I'm telling you, this guy was good at everything that he did. Top of the class, number one pick. But watch what happens. The Bible says in verse 23, and when he was full 40 years old. How many folks we have in the room that are 40? I am, by the way. How many are 40? All right, put your hands up. Good, good, good. Pastor, put your hand down. Okay, wonderful. <laughs> I don't look 25, but I eat my preservatives. But nonetheless, here's this guy that is now 40 years old. He has been raised in the king's palace for 40 years. That's a pretty long time. 40 years. All he knows is Egypt. All he knows is Daddy Pharaoh. All he knows is his life has been handed to him literally on a silver platter. He's got servants. He's got slaves. He's got bling for the king. He's got Tommy Hill flipper clothes. He's got the best chariot. He's got the best mini bike you can buy. He's got the latest iPhone. The guy's got everything, right? Everything is handed to him and he is a mighty man he's now 40 years old and watch what the bible says and when he was full 40 years old it came into his heart to visit his brethren the children of israel now wait a minute it came into his heart to do something that naturally he would not do no, nobody told him oh by the way did you know that you're a hebrew and you ought to go down and, and visit your cousins down there he's never even visited the land of goshen according to what the bible says 40 years he stayed in the palace and it came into his heart. One day he's shaving, he looks himself in the mirror, and something in his heart says, you know what, you need to go visit the Hebrew people. You need to go visit the Israelis. And only God can be good to work that in his heart. Nobody cooked that up. He didn't read that in a book. He didn't see that on Google. He had a movement and a prompting of God in his heart to leave Egypt and go down into that land. It came into his heart. Now understand something. It took him 40 years to fulfill what came into his heart. But once it was there, it never left. And you hear me, and you hear me well. It's not what I'm preaching on tonight, but it is something I want to give a little side note to. If something comes into your heart, if the power of the Spirit of God puts something in your life, I don't care how far you run, I don't care how much you sin, and I don't care where you go and what you do, you will never be happy until you submit to what God put in your heart to begin with. You will always be chaotically out of control until you stop and you submit to what God put in your heart. Our church just recently turned 10 years old. But the backstory is our church should have just turned 12 years old. Because for two years, I knew I was supposed to start our church, but I wouldn't. Man, I was in evangelism, seven suits and seven sermons, flying high, blow in, blow up and blow out and be done with it, right? I used to think to myself, I wonder how a pastor can stay with the same people all the time and preach different sermons. And I'm thinking to myself, why would anybody ever want to live on the road? How boring. I like staying with the same people. 
But for two years in my heart, I was like, no way, not me. I'm not going to tell my friends. I'm not going to tell my wife. And I'm going to tell you what, I would get up and preach and smile like Jimmy Carter and shake hands and all that kind of stuff. This was all pre-Facebook. And I would just, you know, I wasn't living in sin. I wasn't being ignorant and ungodly. But I knew in my heart that I was supposed to get off the road and start a local church in my hometown for broken people. I knew it. So for two years, I lived with that. And it made me miserable. Every time I would preach or every time I would hear somebody preach, I knew that I was not walking in the perfect will of God. I knew it. So one day there was that breaking moment. You ever had those? I was preaching at Faith Baptist Church in Canoga Park, California at a big missions conference. And uh, as I was preaching, I was just reminiscing in my mind, here I am preaching to all of these missionaries going around the world starting churches, and I should have started one two years ago. And then a guy by the name of David Gibbs got up, and he preached a message on discerning the will of God, and it was really life-changing and altering. So I went down front, and I prayed, and I said, all right, Lord, I'm going to talk to my wife about this deal on the way back to the hotel. So we got in the car, and we ate with the preacher and all that, and we're heading back to this hotel, and they had us in this great big old huge, tall, swanky place, and I'm just a country boy, and so you put me in a swanky place, I feel like a ham sandwich in a synagogue. And uh, so sure enough... <laughs> <laughs> We pulled up, in it, and I mean, it was nice, and they had this rental car that I mean, it was to die for. I mean, it was, it was like a Maserati or something. It was all nice, and so it was like wonderful, right? And so I didn't have anything to complain about and whine about. I was just miserable. And so we pulled up to this red light. I'll never forget it. Topanga Canyon Boulevard. Snapshots in my mind right now. I turned left, and about that time, my wife leaned over, and before I could even say anything, she put her hand on my knee, and she said, let me ask you a question. What in the world is wrong with you? <laughs> I said, is it that obvious? She said, listen, you have been struggling for such a long time. What is wrong with you? I said, honey, I'm so glad you're sitting down. I said, because you ain't going to believe what's about to come out of my mouth. She said, try me. I said, for the last two years, I said, I have been praying every single day about canceling our meetings, getting off the road, and going back to my hometown and starting a church and being a pastor. And I know you grew up in a pastor. Something. I started making excuses trying to justify why I couldn't do it, right? She stopped me. She said, what? She said, I've been knowing that for two years. You could have told me that a long time ago. I knew that was going to happen. And I'm like, are you kidding me, woman? What is he? Like you and God have this thing against me? Why couldn't you talk to me and save me a bunch of trouble, right? You've known this for two years. You let me live in misery. But for two years, it was in my heart. I knew what God wanted. And I would never have peace until I surrendered to what God put in my heart. And you run as fast as you want to. You'll be miserable until you tell God yes. So it came into his heart to go visit his brethren, the children of Israel, and watch what happens when he does, verse 24. So he goes down there, and seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed, and he smote the Egyptian. Now, this is kind of a 50,000-foot flyover of the story that we know in the early chapters of Exodus. And if you ever watch anything on the History Channel about, you know, the Bible, they had it in there. They jacked it up, but they had it in there. But nonetheless, we all know about Moses, especially if you grew up like me in the flannel graph days, right? That was some high-tech redneck stuff right there. And so I remember Moses and the burning bush and flannel graph and all that. And so we know the story. So he bebops down from Egypt into the land of Goshen. And while he's there for a very short amount of time, he sees a problem. And the problem is the Egyptians are mistreating, which they had been for 430 years, mistreating the Jewish people. And so he goes over and defends one of his brethren. He goes over to defend one of the Hebrews and watch what the Bible says, okay? He jumps in there, he defends him, he avenged him that was oppressed, and he smote the Egyptian. So this guy with the bulging biceps, and the unbelievable strength, apparently, knocks this guy slap in his mouth and then buries him in the sand, thinking to himself that it was justified that he just saved this poor little Jewish slave. So watch this, verse 25. For he supposed that his brethren would have understood how that God in his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. And that is key to knowing what's going to happen next. He's like, surely when these people see me, they're going to think I'm the greatest thing since sliced bread. When they see how big and, and bulky and bad I am, when they hear my communicative genius, when they hear what I can do, what I can say, and the way that I can dress, surely these people are going to say, wow, this Moses is legitness. This guy is amazing. And he supposed that they would think that. But the Bible says they understood not. When I first read that, I learned a very hard life lesson, and that is this. Be careful who you share what God puts on your heart with because not everybody's going to see the vision God gives you the same way because he didn't give it to them. 
And I remind you that even Joseph's father rebuked him. The man that loved him with all of his heart rebuked him for his dreaming and his visionary lifestyle. And Moses assumed that everybody would have the same vision he did, but the Bible said they understood not. Matter of fact, they were now at this moment a little bit apprehensive. Who is this guy? What is his motivation? So watch what happens. God's going to use this to direct the steps of this man. Verse 26. And the next day he showed himself unto them as they strove. And he would have set them at one again, saying, Sirs, ye are brethren. Why do ye wrong one to another? So here's what's happening in the context. The next day, you get that? The next day he goes back down to Goshen and he finds two Israeli people fighting each other. And I mean, they're all over each other. He jumps up in the middle. Ladies, ladies, you're both pretty. It's okay. And so he breaks up the fight and trying to bring some peace and some resolution to the conflict, right? Your brethren, don't fight. But watch what happens in verse 27. But he that did his neighbor wrong thrust him away, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge over us? Wilt thou kill me as thou didst the Egyptian yesterday? Okay, at this point, if the Bible had overture music, it would be like this. Do -do 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 -do, right? <laughs> now, wait a minute. You got to put on your, your thinking cap for a moment. This guy's 40 years old. He didn't know one person in the land of Goshen. And he goes down after 40 years. And, okay, he goes down one day, and then he goes down the next day. So he's only visited these people two times in 40 years. What are the chances that he's going to run into the same two people when there's three and a half million of them like a stomped ant bed all over the place. There wasn't 15 people. It wasn't a revival meeting church house. Well, there were three and a half million people in the land of Goshen. They were everywhere. What are the chances of the Kowinky Dinky that in 40 years of not knowing one of them, he's going to just bump into and bebop around the same one both days? I'm telling you, that's the design of God. God was setting him up for greatness. But it was going to look a whole lot like failure before the greatness ever came around. And so he said, you're going to kill me like you killed the other one? So watch what happens in verse 29. Here's where everything shifts. And this is where our context is moving tonight. Then fled Moses at this saying. Notice, not at the doing, but at the saying. And was a stranger in the land of Midian where he begat two sons. Now look at me a moment. We'll pick up the reading here in just a minute. Here's this guy that has more education than anybody we know anything about in the Old Testament. The guy was mighty in word and mighty in deed. And if the Holy Ghost goes out of his way to tell me you're mighty, you are mighty. When God says you're legit, you're legit. This guy could talk. This guy could fight. This guy could communicate. He could sing. He could dance. He was the whole thing, the whole ball of wax. Everyone wanted to be Moses. And now he runs from himself, from God, from the reality of his family, from the Egyptians, from the Israelis, from Pharaoh. He runs at this saying, and he goes to the land of Midian, and he's there for 40 years. 40 years. Look what the next verse says. This is crazy. Verse 30. And when 40 years were expired. What? 40 years. So he's 40 years old. He runs into the desert for 40 more years and doesn't surface until he's 80. You see, you'll never be too old to serve God. Amen. You'll never be too young to serve God. But sadly, some of you are far too stubborn to serve God. He can use anybody that desires to be used if you'll just submit. And so he goes in this desert for 40 years. Now, here's what I want you to gather tonight, and here's what the rest of these verses are going to teach us. Do you remember, during that 40-year time period, he meets his wife, he has kids, the Bible says so. Do you remember for 40 years what Moses became on the backside of the Midian Desert? Somebody help me. Right, a shepherd. The most lowly, loathing, non-paying, way below minimum wage, outrageously ridiculous job that nobody wanted. And this guy was smarter than anybody in the room. Had more education, more letters before and after his name than anybody else. Probably Pharaoh himself. I mean, the guy was trained and schooled in the greatest universities that the world offered. He could have any woman he wanted. He could have any riches that he wanted. The guy had it all for 40 years of his life. And then all of a sudden he runs into the desert and for the next 40 years, he's a shepherd. 
He goes from royalty, silk clothes, to cleaning up sheep poop? Are you kidding me? The guy lives in a cave. He becomes a, a, a wind-blistered old man that lives in the sand dunes for 40 years. Long enough, by the way, for Egypt to forget all about him and for Moses to forget all about them. He forgot all about his fancy education out there in that desert. He forgot about his fancy clothes and that wad of cabbage of cash that he carried around in his back pocket. He forgot about all the fast-paced, high-level lifestyle that he had lived for the first 40 years. And for the next 40 years, he is a lowly shepherd with a despicable job. And nobody knows jack sprout about this guy for 40 years. And everybody forgets him. He lives in a cave. And that's it. And all he does is walk around shepherding sheep. What a boring job, right? One thing about it, if you do, you know, shepherd sheep, at least if you preach to them, you have a captive audience because they say amen all the time. But nonetheless, <laughs> at least the kids got it, praise God. But anyhow, so for 40 years, right, he's got his little robe, he's got his little dirty feet and sandals, and he's got his little staff, his little stick, and here he is, 40 years, cleaning sheep, leading sheep, shearing sheep, protecting the sheep, fighting back the wolves, fighting back the insects, taking them to the steel waters, showing them where to eat. Forty years this guy does this. That's all he knows. And yet he's the wisest guy that you know anything about. The guy could preach circles around me and 15 more just like me. The guy knew everything. And now for 40 years, he's a nobody. A nobody. And then all of a sudden, we're not going to go there, but I want you to jot down, if you would, Psalm 77, verse 20. Because Psalm 77 and verse 20 is an unbelievable proof text for where we're going in this text tonight. Because in essence, here's what it says. After 40 years, do you remember what Moses finally did? He went back in. Ten major plagues from God fail. He delivered the people of Israel after all of this time. We'll, we'll see that in a moment, this burning bush experience. But wait a minute. You know the Bible says in Psalm 77 and verse 20 that when God, this is from God's vantage point, that when God saw the children of Israel vacate Egypt after 430 years, God himself said, and I quote, that the people were as a flock being led by the hand of Moses and Aaron. Right. Let me ask you a question, church. If God said they were like a flock being led by the hand of Moses, the question is, where did he learn to lead people like that? In the backside of the desert without Egypt's education. Mm, that's good, brother. And without the money that they were pouring into him. And without his silk robes and his regalia. And what God is saying is, Moses, I can use you. And I've never needed Egypt one time to get my job done. I've never needed what the world's had. I've never needed what they have, what that crowd. I've never needed them to get the job done. And he never will. He just needs submission and brokenness is all he needs. And for 40 years, God beat Egypt out of Moses. He beat that education out of him. All he needed was a broke down, wrinkled up, weathered old man. Because when it first happened, when he was 40, had he delivered the people, Moses would have got the glory. But after 40 years of Moses was beat out of Moses, it was God that got the glory. It was God that got the glory. And the Bible says after 40 years, this man leads them out. And we think to ourselves, what a waste. 40 years, the guy becomes a shepherd? That's all God needed. Because when they came out, he said, I need you to lead them like sheep. And you only learn to lead sheep by getting a staff and doing it. And for 40 years, God used this man in a way that seemed incidental, foolish, almost a waste of education. And yet when 40 years were expired, God said, the only thing I need from you is your shepherding abilities. Now go down there, get your stick, and lead the people out like a bunch of sheep. And they followed him because sheep follow the shepherd. So watch what happens. Verse 30 says, And when 40 years were expired, there appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai an angel of the Lord in a flame of fire in a bush. Now I know some of you. You're like, oh, that burning bush business. 
That's a bunch of nonsense. You're foolish to believe that. Hey, Bucko, you're foolish not to. This ain't a Marvel comic book. This is the Word of Almighty God. If my Bible would have said he'd have talked to a pink elephant in the desert, I'd have believed that I'll take my chance with God, not with you. It's what the Bible says, right? The man talked to a bush that was on fire by the glory of God. You say, well, I can't explain that. There's a lot of things I can't explain, but I still believe it. The world says, well, seeing is believing. The Bible says believing is seeing because God don't do miracles for skeptics. He does miracles for those that believe, you understand. So he walks out there and this thing is on fire. And I love this, verse 31. When Moses saw it, he wondered. <laughs> I bet he did. I'd have been freaked out of the frame. He wondered at it. He's like, what is this? Right? And I love this. And as he drew near to behold it, the voice of the Lord came into him. Now that's crazy because I'll be honest. If I saw that, I wouldn't be drawing near to behold nothing. Right? That's bad English, but it's good preaching. I would not be drawing near. I'd be like, oh yeah, wow. That bush is on fire. There's a voice coming out of it. Let's go check this out. Right? I'd be like going the opposite direction, you know. You know, in America, we have been conditioned because of Hollywood. We've been conditioned to walk towards danger. You ever notice that? How many of you remember, and I know the kiddos and teenagers won't remember this, but how many of you remember, like, really, really back in the day when the first Mummy movie came out? I mean, like, black and white, wrapped in toilet paper, crazy. Okay, you know what I'm talking about? That one, right? Don't put your lip out. You watched it. But nonetheless... <laughs> I remember when I was a kid watching that Bummy movie, wearing my Batman pajamas and slippers, eating some Briar's ice cream, and I knew what was coming. And by the way, so did the people. It was in a script. Good grief. And I remember that mummy was in the library. Huh? What you thinking, Captain? Remember that? that mummy was in the library and it kept showing him, kept going back and forth. This corny as could be these days. But he was in the library and that woman was walking around like, where is he? Where is he? And she heard something in the library and she starts walking towards the library. And I'm standing up and I'm like, no! <laughs> Don't go to the library! <laughs> We've been conditioned to be attracted to dangerous, strange things, right? And so, man, he's like a moth drawn to the flame. He's like, oh, wow, a bush, it's on fire, and somebody's talking out of it. Isn't that amazing? And so he drew near to it to behold it, and the voice of the Lord came unto him. Watch this, verse 32, saying, this is interesting, I am the God of thy fathers, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now, wait a minute. God said that a bunch in the Bible. But I don't know if ever it meant as much as it just did. Because look at me, here's what happened. Moses for 40 years at this point has been questioning the validity of who he really is. The guy was raised in Egypt and called to deliver people he doesn't even know, but he's their blood kin. And now for 80 years, 40 in obscurity, and 40 before that in Egypt, in popularity, now 80 years. And God says, let me tell you something. You know why I'm calling you Moses? Because I'm the God of your fathers. Notice, he did not say, I'm the God of Pharaoh. I'm not the God of your presidential stepfather. I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You're a Hebrew whether you want to admit it or not, young man. And I'm calling you because I'm the God of your fathers. And he gave him an identity. He said, you get up and bow your back like a banny rooster and you walk down there and you tell those people, let my people go. Let them go. I am the God, he says, of your fathers. Now watch the end of verse 32. When he heard that, then Moses trembled. And he durst not behold. So he turns his face and he begins to understand the reality of who he is. The, the daunting responsibility and the anointing and the calling that is now upon his life. You want me to do what? You want me to be the ringleader to deliver these people that have been generationally in bondage for 430 years? Yes. And guess what? I didn't need anything Egypt gave you to get it done. Because I'd like to remind you that if you go to the early chapters of Exodus, he began to throw out a whole bunch of excuses, none of which held water in God's canteen. But when God called him, can I remind you what the very first excuse was? That's exactly right. He said, I'm a stutterer. And I can't talk. If that ain't God, don't answer it. But then nonetheless, he said, I'm a stutterer. <laughs> now, it's interesting to me, Pastor. Think about this. The Bible just said he was mighty in word and in deed. And 40 years later, he tells God, uh, 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 he gets the baptistic porky pig syndrome and can't even talk. <laughs> The guy can't even speak to himself in the mirror with confidence. 
And yet the Holy Spirit said when he was younger, he was the greatest communicator in the room. He was the most well-scripted, well-memorized, well-rehearsed university seminarian there was, and now the guy can't even talk? Why? Because God didn't need him when he had all the words. God needed him when he didn't know what to say. Listen, God doesn't need your money that's in the bank. He doesn't need the house you have. He doesn't need the position you have. He doesn't need the education you have. He just needs you when you are at your lowest level and you are broke as a joke and you have no one else to turn to but him. And when Moses didn't have Egypt, didn't have Pharaoh, and didn't have all of those ornaments to hang on himself, he said, I have nothing. And God said, that's why I want you, son. Because if you would have went then, you would have said, look at my muscles. Look at my preaching ability. Look at my singing ability. Look at how big our church is. Look what we're doing for you, God, and then steal and rob all the credit and all the glory. And God said, I'm going to let you be a weathered down, beat up, dirty old shepherd for the next 40 years of your life. You're going to forget about Egypt. They're going to forget about you. Then we're going to talk, Moses, because then you'll be ready. And he beat Moses out of Moses. You know, when I started our church 10 and a half years ago, I can relate somewhat. I'm no Moses, not even close, but I can relate somewhat because I liken the years that I traveled in evangelism to a wild stallion, to a wild horse. I don't minimize what I used to do. I don't demonize who I was. I thank God for what the Lord taught me, for the men of God that loved me, those that led me to Christ, discipled me, taught me the word of God, showed me how to preach, put preach in me. I love those men. But let me tell you something about the 10 years that I gave to evangelism. I say to you tonight that what I mean by I was a wild stallion is this. A wild stallion is a beautiful animal, but it has no practical value at all. Your kids can't ride it because it's wild. Oh, it can neigh and huff and, and all that bunch of nonsense. It's pretty, it's slick, it's got big hooves, big old tail, big mane, it's got big old veins popping out of its neck. It is a beautiful beast to behold, but it has no practical value. You can't feed it, you can't pet it, you can't ride it, you can't touch it. Because it's never been broken. But if you break it, it'll be like a poodle pup around the house. It'll go where you say to go. It'll eat when you say eat. It'll drink when you say drink. It'll ride when you say ride. Your kids can feed it anything they want to and it'll never spit in their face or bite their hand because it's been broken. And for 10 years, let me tell you something. I could neigh with the best of them. I could sweat with the best of them. I could wear the same suits and ties with the best of them. But at the end of the day, I had no practical value because I'd never been broken. And when God broke me, and gave me a love for broken people. He let me know something. Gregory Dwayne Locke, I don't need your seminary education. I don't care how well you think you can communicate. I don't need any of that. All I need for you to do is stand up, put that microphone in your hand, and say what I tell you to say. And when you do that, then we'll get the job done. And God doesn't need all that stuff that you think he needs to be the person he's called you to be. He just needs you to be broken, submissive, and honest. And Moses didn't need any of the stuff that he thought he needed, but now the rubber meets the road spiritually. Because he's already trembling, right? He's already not looking. He's already afraid and timid and shy in the very presence of God, as would we be. But notice what happens next. It's fascinating to me. In verse 33, Then said the Lord to him, Put off thy shoes from thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy ground. Now, you have to understand the double-edged sword that just came from this context. I know we sing songs, we are standing on holy ground. I'm here to preach, not sing, thank God. But nonetheless, you understand the context. We know that song, we know this verse. But if we're not careful, we'll miss the purpose of the interpretation being lost in the application. Because we like the application. Oh, the Bible says, pull off your shoes because it was a holy place. You know, when we come to church, let's not even wear shoes, right? It's a holy place. That's not what he's talking about. He already knew he was in a holy place. He wouldn't even look at the bush. Remember, previous verse? He durst not behold the presence of God. He wouldn't even look at God. So he was already in a place of holiness and reverence and fear and timidity. But God took it one step further and he said, let me tell you what we're going to do before we go any further, Mr. Moses, man. Pull your shoes off. Now, when Moses pulled his shoes off, by the way, and slid them into the presence of God, in the next two verses, what we're going to see is that that is when God says, now... I'm going to say, not then, not 40 years earlier when everybody told you you were ready, 
Not way back when, when you felt like you were ready and you just supposed everybody would assume that you were ready because you look so good and talk so well. He said, no, now. You know, there are customs in the Bible that in our American verbiage and terminology, we know not of. There's some crazy stuff in the Old Testament. Really, there is. I mean, some crazy stuff. And some people are like, well, why would God put all that deviant stuff in the Bible? That just proves it's not the Bible. Can I remind you, there's a difference between an example and an endorsement. God examples a lot of things that he never endorses. But there's some stuff in the Bible that I scratch my head and I'm thinking, what is that? For instance, in this context, what we find out is that in a greater context, in the book of Ezra and in the book of Ruth, do you remember how the men would make contractual obligations one to another? When they would go to the bank to borrow money? When a man would marry off his daughter, if you will? Do you remember that they wouldn't spit in her hand and shake it? They wouldn't sign their John Hancock to the back of a receipt, put it in a vault somewhere, Okay, they, they didn't bury a time capsule in the ground for 50 more years. They didn't talk on the phone. It wasn't a verbal agreement. One of the strangest customs that the Jews had was two men would swap, uh, swap shoes. And when a man would pull his shoes off, it was a picture of his authority. It was a sign of who he was. That's why how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel. The Bible has a lot to say about feet because the feet of a man is what carries him. It's what feeds his family. It's his authority. It's his foundation. It's who he is. It's the identity of a man. It's not just his foot. It's who the man is. And so these men would swap shoes as a sign of a covenant, a contractual obligation. I'm giving you my shoe. You're giving me your shoe because I'm entering into a covenant with you and I'm going to keep my end of the bargain. That was the purpose of shoe swapping in the Old Testament, just in case you read that and thought, what? And the purpose is of shoe swapping. That's what it is right there, right? It wasn't so they could smell each other's shoes or like each other's Nikes. Oh, wow, look what you got, man. Those are some hot shoes. That's what my kids would say, right? But no, they would swap shoes because it was basically like signing a contract, an agreement. We are going into business together. Moses knew that. He didn't just pull his shoes off because he was on holy ground for the sake of the fact that God was there. He already knew God was there. He wouldn't even look at him for the verse before that. God said, I've got everything. I've taken it all from you, Moses. You can't speak well anymore. You certainly don't look well anymore. You don't have them big bulging biceps. You are weather beaten and sand stricken and all you know how to do is lead sheep. And I've got you where I want you. But there's one thing I don't have yet. I don't have the final symbol of your authority. I don't have that last little bit of who you really are. So pull your shoes off. Slide them into my presence. Enter into a contractual obligation with me and I will keep my end of the bargain and you pull off your shoes because you are in my presence. And we're going to do business together. And Moses pulled his shoes off slid them into the presence of God and watch what happens, verse 34. I have seen, I have seen the affliction of my people which is in Egypt. And I've heard their groaning. And I'm come down to deliver them. Now watch this. And now. Not 40 years ago when you wanted to do it. Not 40 years ago when everybody said you was equipped to do it. But now that I have everything. Now that your authority is in the palm of my hand, and now, he said, what I want you to do is come, and I will send thee into Egypt. This Moses, whom they refused, saying, who made thee a ruler and a judge? The same did God send to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel, which appeared to him in the bush. He, Moses, brought them out. After they had showed signs and wonders in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness, 40 more years... 40 years in Egypt, 40 years in the wilderness, on the backside of the desert by himself, and then 40 more years with the people wandering, meandering in the wilderness, bebopping all over the place. It should have taken them two weeks geographically to get there. It took them 40 years. Hebrews said they enter not in because of unbelief. They did not get there because their GPS system was broke. They could have crossed the rivers and been there in two weeks. Took them 40 years. Matter of fact, that whole generation died off and Moses himself didn't even go into the promised land when Joshua led them in. 
And yet, once he slid that final sign of significance into the very presence of God, and God knew, I've got all you now, son. Every bit of you, lock, stock, and barrel, I've got you. God said, now, I got you where I want you. Now, you go down, you shake that hickory stick, and you tell them, let my people go. Ten plagues are going to fall, and you're going to get these people, and you're going to walk out of here, and you're going to march right through the waters of the Red Sea like two elevator doors in a hospital building. I'm going to send you quail. I'm going to send you manna. I'm going to send you water from a rock. I am going to let you live for 40 years, and the Bible says that the shoes of their feet never wore off. Now, neighbor, if I can find where God shopped, I'd be a millionaire, I guarantee you. My wife's got a sign on the fridge that the shoe fits, bite in every color. Praise God. Amen. Remember, pay less, two for the price of one plus a dollar. Their shoes never wore off for 40 years. God bless these people. And here is this man that leads them out. And God said, you're going to be the one. You're going to be the hero. Not because I needed Egypt, but because I needed brokenness. Because I needed humility. Because I needed someone who felt defeated and less than and worthless. I didn't need somebody that was puffed up, proud, arrogant, and haughty and thought they were all that and then some. He said, I couldn't use you then, but I can loot, loot, use you now. And when he had nothing left to offer, God said, I'm going to fill you up to overflowing and you are going to do one of the greatest miracles. And guess what? Moses, the meekest man in the whole Old Testament, everybody, even lost people, know about Moses. Everybody knows about Moses. And here's the interesting thing. As I read through Genesis, as I read through Exodus, as I read through Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, and I studied those Old Testament books, and I began to read how God used this man in unbelievable ways and then brought things to his memory that he didn't even know and inspired him to write the Decalogue, the Pentateuch of God. When he comes to the end of his life, he looks at a young man named Joshua, and he said, I hate to tell you this, but you're going to have to lead the people in. I can't go. He struck the rock. He had some anger management issues, you know, kind of like, you know, Tony Stewart of NASCAR. And uh, so he wasn't able to go in. And so he says to Joshua, I'm going to go up on top of Mount Nebo and I'm going to talk to the Lord. I'm going to look in, but I can't go in. And here's something interesting that you ought to know as a side note. The people that God will use to get you where you are are not always the same people that God will use to get you where he wants you. Some people come for seasons and some people come for reasons. And Moses was not able to go in, but Joshua led the people across the Jordan River, you remember. But the interesting thing is this. When he went up on top of Mount Nebo, here is now a 120-year-old man. 120 years old. You talk about beat down. You talk about old feeling and looking. 120 years old. And yet the Bible tells me and I'd never seen this before. It's one of those glorious little nuggets of truth that you just have to see and read and it's, you just got to see it with your own eyes and even believe it. And I came across something that no doubt I'd read before, never paid attention. And it said something to this effect. And it came to pass that Moses died, comma, and the Lord buried him. There are tens of thousands of people mentioned in this Bible. And only one of them that ever got a eulogy from God himself at his funeral. And it came to pass that Moses died, comma, and the Lord buried him. There was something so supernaturally significant about this broken, beat up old man that took his shoes off that God said, I'll handle these funeral arrangements myself. And the Bible says that he didn't even tell the people where the body was buried because you know people well enough that I'd dig him up and worship him, put him in the Vatican somewhere and still be worshiping him. God buried Moses. By the way, so spiritually significant that when you get to the book of Daniel, when Daniel said, I've been praying for God to send an angel to deliver me, Michael was withstood fighting the devil over the body of Moses. Even the devil thought the body of Moses was supernaturally significant. And I read that and I think to myself, what's the big deal about a 120-year-old man, a shepherd? And there was just something about his humility, about his brokenness, about walking away from everything that he knew and every comfort that he understood. And God looks at him and says, Sir, 
I'm going to use you to perform one of the greatest feats of miraculous amazements in the history of the whole Bible. And all I need, think about it, is your shoes. That's it. Just give me the final sign of your authority, Moses. Just sign on the dotted line. And when I know you're all in, you can know I'm all in. And when Moses took his shoes off, God said, mm-hmm, took 40 years, but now you're going to change the world. And God doesn't need us and our ability, but he desires us and our availability. And may tonight we spiritually, if not physically, pull the shoes off and get in God's presence. Father, thank you tonight for the word of God. Lord, I have no idea why you laid this passage into my heart. It's been so long since I've preached on this. And yet, Lord, tonight you've, you've worked my own spirit over about it. Because, Lord, we think we've got to have all the money and all the savings and everything's got to be just right and every T has to be crossed and every I has to be dotted and we have to be just so and have so much education and so much ability and you don't need any of it. You're just asking us to be available, to surrender, to simply give up, give in, shimmy up the white flag of surrender and quit making excuses for why we don't do what you've already called us to do. In this room right now, there are people, Lord, it is coming to their heart and they are miserable because they won't submit to it and they know it. So, Lord, forgive us when we think it's about our gifts, it's about our talents. What nonsense! It's not about us, it's about the glory of God. It's about the authority and the power of the gospel. For it is the gospel that's the power of God, not our stories, not our tear-jerking illustrations, not our ability, not our education. It is the gospel that we stand on. We are in a win-win situation. We cannot lose if we surrender to you. So, Lord, I don't care if people are in here five years old or 105 years old. We have got to be fully committed and surrendered. So, Lord, tonight, we pull off, as it were, the shoes of our heart. And we slide them in your presence and we say, Lord, we give you the final sign of who we are. We give you our money. We give you our marriage. We give you our kids. We give you our job. We give you everything. And then, Lord, maybe, just maybe, some people need maybe perhaps more of a vivid visual illustration and maybe a few folks ought to just come and get on their face and really just pull them off. Just pull their shoes off and pray tonight and say, God, I'm just visibly showing you my heart. And tonight, Lord, I pray that you would break us and you would forgive us for the rebellion of that which you've put in our heart, we would have had peace months and years ago if we'd have just said yes. Your will is always better. So help us tonight. As our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, I want to ask you a question. All over this room, whether you represent this wonderful church or whether you represent another church or no church, but you're here tonight. In the choir, the left, the right, the front, the middle, the back, all over this room. How many of you would say, Pastor Locke, I know I can tell you why God told you to preach on that unusual text. Because if it didn't help a soul in this room, it burned in my heart and the Holy Spirit of God hit me dead center right in the chest and I know God spoke to me tonight. And if I'm the only one, I'll acknowledge it by the uplifting of my hand that God indeed has humbled my heart and helped me with his word tonight. Would you slip your hand up all over this room, wherever you are? God bless you, many of us. Many, 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 many hands all over the room. Would you stand with me? Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. If you're able to stand, just stand for a moment. I know it's crowded, but just stand for a moment. As we're bowed before the Lord, I want to ask you this. I don't know what you normally do here at Clearbrook. I don't know what you do in the church where you're from. But my grandfather had a principle, and it was this. Strike while the iron's hot. I believe you ought to respond while the Holy Spirit's speaking. You say, well, I'll wait till I get to the restaurant. I'll wait till I get home. God will speak to me then. He might, but he might not, and I don't want to take that chance. I'm asking you right now, as some are beginning to do, to slip out. You raise your hand. I can only see your hand. I serve a God that can see your heart. We'll make room for you down here. Use the front pew, whatever you have to do. But I'm asking you right now, would you come and fall on your face tonight and say, God, I'm giving you everything. Here's my shoes. Here's my heart. Here's my home, my marriage. Here's it all, Lord. You can have every bit of it. It's time to surrender. It's time to get real with God. Quit worrying about what you don't have and start using what you do have. Come on, God bless you. Take your time. Folks still coming. 
God bless you, young lady. Come on. If you need somebody to pray with you tonight, we'll do that. Pastor's here. I'm here. Brother Wayne, a gentleman of our church here. We got other men, men of God here. Youth director here. Associate pastor here. Choir director. We'll help you. We'll help you tonight. If you walk out of this room unchanged, it won't be God's fault. It won't be mine. It'll be yours. To whom much is given, much will be required. You can never again say, I never knew, because you heard it tonight. And what you need to know is God calls for surrender. Surrender to his word. Come on. You pray with these that are here. I can't tell you what God's telling you. I don't know the needs of your heart and your family and what God's speaking to you about. But I promise you, 100% across this room, God wants us to be surrendered. And he wants to, as it were, give him our shoes tonight.